born in um, Gross Point, Michigan, and I was like, you know, every other kid. I loved the monkeys, and I loved Hee Haw, and I loved, you know, like the Universal Monsters and stuff like that. It's so funny, it's like nothing's changed, it seems like, but um, I remember I had a very collective soul, even like early, early on when I was a kid, I had to collect everything, and uh, when I uh, first noticed guitar playing and things like that, I was, you know, like so young, I was like, uh, like probably six or something, and you know, we would watch Hee Haw, and I saw, um, you know, the, they would always play, have musical acts, and they would always have a Telecaster on, on you know, because that's what most of the country guys played. They were playing these cool looking tellies like Don Rich, and um, you know, they would always, Buck Owens, they'd always play these cool sparkle tellies, and I was like, oh, you know, this is so cool, I want to play guitar. And I thought the Telecaster was the only guitar shape there was. I thought the electric guitar was just a Telecaster. There was no other models and things like that. It was just that. So I think that's what's stuck in my brain about wanting to play guitar is uh, wanting to play a Telecaster. It was from that early time. You know, I got a guitar early on when I was like seven and I started taking lessons and I was so obsessed of it, so obsessed that I would play all the time and I was growing, you know, I was so little and um, my hand here actually stretched and uh, actually this hand is bigger than this hand, uh, like uh, oddly, weirdly uh, larger, you know, so because I played so much. So, you know, that's what kind of kid I was. I was just kind of obsessed with it right away. Um, I would have to say probably, you know, the monkeys, you know, that, that probably had the real impact on me. I know it sounds silly, but it was like so like, you know, it, I love the songs. And I just love the whole thing because all I did was watch TV. But I was still really into my monsters, my fav famous monsters magazines and things like that. And then when Kiss came along, I was like, oh, they're like monsters with guitars. I mean, this is incredible. But I was already playing guitar, I think, before Kiss came around, you know. And uh, but the two just came together, and I was, it was that was it for me. And I remember when Love Gun came out, and I bought it, and it was just it, that was it. And then I had, you know, epiphanies over time, of course, with different players and all that stuff. But I was at an early age, I was into the country thing too. You know, we'd always listen to Jerry Reed and. Uh, Les Paul and stuff like that early on. I really enjoyed. I I really enjoyed people that could do something really well, even if it was like someone on a bike or someone juggling or something like that. And that's why I was so drawn to these great guitar players. I was like, I knew right away this person was doing something special. That's the thing I love to do. Is I love to learn, love to learn, and. Uh, just always, always, I'm learning something new pretty much uh, every other day or every three days. I'm learning something new and um, I think it's so important. So it's never really stopped. It, I just really um, have a passion for, for learning and because um, I wanted to be a session musician when I was young and you know I, I knew what I wanted to do and I just wanted to be a session guy. I never really even dreamt of being a, you know, a famous musician. I think it was too far beyond my dreams. It was too, it was like becoming a superhero. It was just too far out of reach. So I just was like, I just want to be a session musician. And that's why I learned like all these different styles because again, TV, 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 there was like this show like called Session Man or something, this movie. And, um, you know, this guy would just come in and play and it was just, I was like, wow, that's what I want to do, you know, and that's, and that's really what I was doing when I moved to LA. I was just a session guy and I played, you know, for 20, like, I'd say like 50% less than everyone else. And and I would do it really fast because they want to get you in and out of there and I would do it for cheap and so everybody was using me at first, you know. 
Uh, let's see, I was, let's see, um, I guess just turning 18. So, you know, and I was brought up in a, you know, very safe environment and a good upbringing and, uh, you know, kind of had whatever I wanted. And then moving to Los Angeles, it was just such a reality check, you know, it was, uh, but I wanted it so bad. And, you know, most people go home after the first, you know, couple of months because it is difficult, but I got, you know, robbed the first couple of nights I was there. And, uh, but I stuck it out, you know, and, because I wanted it so bad. And I lived at this place called the Hollywood Billiards and um, it was three floors of rehearsal rooms. And it was, the first floor was like, you know, you could go downstairs, go to the play pool or whatever like that. And then there was one floor, it's just probably, I don't know, 10 or 12 rooms of just bands rehearsing. Second floor, same thing, third floor. And I lived on the top floor and we lived there and there was, you know, there was no bathroom or there was no window. We didn't have a window and, uh, you know, it was super, super, super dangerous. So we just pounded nails. Um, so the nails were sticking out the door so you couldn't kick in the door. There were so many things that would just knock you down. It was, it was pretty, it was pretty intense. I guess when I first started making money, I was like playing for you know, a different artist a day, you know, it could be like Robin Zander or, you know, Baywatch or, uh, you know, um, Street Fighter, or, you know, like that. Anything like that, I was making money, but I guess my first break break, um, my first big tour I got, I was playing with Katie Lang and I was rubbing shoulders with Madonna and Prince and Peter Gabriel and, you know, flying in private jets and, playing multiple nights at Radio City Music Hall and, and uh, you know, you had your own chef and masseuse and, uh, you know, it was, it was pretty wild to say the least, you know. But the work started when I was a kid, you know, because with Katie Lang it was all Nashville tunings or it was all, uh, you know, it was chicken picking or it was, uh, you know, things like that, not your your uh, rock thing, and but luckily, you know, the work that I put in as a kid studying that, you know, that helped, you know, like the chiming harmonics or the double stops or the, you know, all, all that kind of stuff really paid off. You know, and I was doing it for decades, <laughs> it seems like, um, when I, before I even showed anybody I could do it. I just love to play guitar. You know, I would do these, uh, you know, all this Spanish flamenco or Western swing or something. It just relaxes me. So I'll sit around all day and just play guitar and watch TV and, and, and do things like that. But that's what makes me happy. And then when I put out, you know, my instrumental record, you know, you know, everyone knew me from like Marilyn Manson and, you know, they didn't even know I could play anything else and then I'm you know doing like Sweet George Brown or you know Sugarfoot Rag or something like that it was pretty shocking for people you know but it's just how I played and uh, you know I think it's it's great if you can have educate some people on the way because there's a lot of you know great guitar players out there a lot of great pickers out there you know and which I still seem to you know uh, realize and find. There's this guy named Joe Mafis. It's unbelievable. And he's back in the 50s, not very well known, but it's just unbelievable. I love him. So there's, you know, things like that. that and, and I'd love to inspire people on the way. I think that's what's most important because that's what happened with me. If it depends on who I'm going to write with. And I'll usually write for people that I really, really respect and love like you know a Rod Stewart or a David Lee Roth or you know uh, people like that Skinnerd or something because I know their catalog probably as well as they do and um, I think the first time I met Skinnerd I went to Nashville and it was cold and I had a big huge fur jacket on I had no eyebrows and uh, you know I was just I looked cr crazy to say the least and 
I walked in and, you know, they literally, it sounds like I'm joking, but they literally thought I was in the wrong place, you know, and they, it was a mistake. And I had to physically sit down and just play a little something, you know, for them to, because they really thought it was, you know, I was joking or something like that. So, but it ended up great and I, you know, we're great friends and I was, ended up um, co-writing like five or six songs off that record that I did with them. So if they say, oh, give me something from like, you know, like that B section, you know, from the album Nothing Fancy, you know, I'll know exactly what they're talking about. I'll prepare crazy. I'll prepare because here's the thing. You'll say, all right, well, no, I don't like that. How, what else you got? And you have to have just an arsenal of things ready to go. And you, you have to play them with conviction as well. Um, because with writing, it's so easy, it's so easy for the artist to go, nah, I, no, not that, what else? No, no, not, no, because that, uh, that's, that's not really what I'm looking for, you know. So you have to be very well prepared and ready for anything. Um, scoring is very, very, very difficult. I did uh, scoring before on movies, but my first full-length movie, The Lords of Salem, it's very, very difficult. There's, um, I did like 60-something cues of music, and you know, these are little pieces of music, and it's, you know, it's very, very difficult, very time-consuming, and uh, I mean, that's a lot, those are like 60 little songs. <laughs> I mean, that's a lot, that, there's a lot of music. And sometimes, you know, it's just, uh, you know, no time signature, or there's no key signature, or sometimes there are these big orchestra pieces. So um, it is a lot of work, but I love a challenge. And, uh, you know, it's kind of how I look at it. It's music that people don't listen to because it's not supposed to distract you. It's supposed to help the movie, but it, it's not supposed to distract you. Once it distracts you, it's your, um, you're not doing your job. Like Rob will say, oh, we're looking for something like this or like that. And uh, that helped a tremendous amount because he would have these cue sheets for me and have notes what he was looking for. And this next film that he's doing 31, he's going to uh, score it with me. So it's going to be uh, all so easy because, you know, he's obviously the director and he'll tell me what, what exactly what he'll want, you know, so it'll be great. No, oh, God damn it. <laughs> Can you cut that out? The guitar collection, let's see, started, a, like I said in the beginning of the interview, I have a very collective soul and I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but Man, you know, I think it started, I collected these KISS posters, because it was, everything is from when you're a kid, you know, if it's comic books or baseball cards. But I would collect, you know, I had these KISS posters when I was a kid, and you know, you'd, this was like before even eBay, I think, you know, but I knew that these posters were worth a lot of money, so I started like, buying these KISS posters and then I got more aggressive into it and uh, then I would get their venue posters which were really hard to get and they're super super expensive so you know I just would have the, I had this massive massive poster collection it was huge and then I just you know pretty much had everything and I was doing it for so long I was like you know, I'm gonna sell it now, and I sold it for such a massive, huge amount of money. And that's when I started, I bought my first um, vintage guitar, and it was a 1966 Fender Esquire. And I bought it for such a low price at that time, and it's just escalated beyond belief. And um, so I just started buying with this money from the Kiss posters. and. Uh, I just love it. You know, I only, I have, you know, tons of guitars, like Les Pauls and, uh, you know, name it, I have it, you know, but I just mainly collect the old Telecasters, but I have tons and tons of others, you know, SG, any, 
Firebird, any guitar you can think of, Strats, and but um, Telecasters were my are my love, and I'll started because I'm so obsessive. I start from the very first year, 1950 broadcaster, and I go to about you know like through the 80s and things like that. So I'm pretty much have one from every year, but now I'm getting all these like because I have a lot of them. So now I'm getting all these different colors and things that go with this or, you know, upgrading a little bit. But it's a great, man, it's such a fun, fun, fun thing to um, collect because it's a great investment, you know. It is such a, it's such a great thing because you can play these things, you record with them, and, you know, the history and the knowledge of it is un unbelievable. Unbelievable the history of these guitars. It's great. It's got to be all original. It's got the only thing that has to be changed on it is the string. So it's got to be all original. And I have these, you know, I can tell pretty well. You know, I can look at wiring or I could look at lacquer and I could look at wood grain or uh, screws even. Then if I like how it looks, then I'll take it to these real experts, you know, and that are just crazy crazy experts that they could tell certain plastics or something like that and that's what it goes to most people who I deal with are a hundred percent on the level they'll be like yes this is original and you know the guy is telling the truth and blah 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 so it's um, it's worked out really well for me but there's some horror stories out there that people have they think they're getting a great deal and um, they don't, I never really got a great deal like, oh my God, I found this incredible thing for this much money and it's worth this, I never really got that. You know, there, it's great because a lot of them, there's certain places that are in crates and they're really expensive ones. And I have them three stories, you know, uh, three crates up. So if there's any floods, like, oh my God, that that poor flood in Nashville, you know, that just ruined all these amazing guitars. So I have them way up high and they're all insured and stuff like that. So yeah, I have, and then I have ones at my house that um, I just play, you know, I just will, if I'm getting ready for the tour, I'll just knock it off, you know, play them. But then I got the house robbed and, but luckily none of the super expensive guitars were in the house. I don't know, I always wanted to use just a regular Fender Heavy pick, you know? And <laughs> it's funny because my picks, I really get into my picks too, you know? People love collecting the picks. I have all these crazy picks and I change them every tour and, and things like that, you know? Like, you know, there's a, you know, there's a Eddie Munster and I have all the Munsters or something like that. So. People really get into the picks, and uh, I think you know that has a great deal to do with it. And uh, yeah, but my pedal board is just you know I use Boss Effects, and I have one wah pedal, but I pretty much just use that on one song. So um, if I didn't have it, you know, it's not like the show couldn't go on. But but and then the heads, the Marshalls, you know, I use 900s. I have a couple 800s. But here's that collective soul again. It's so ridiculous. But I have like a, you know, all these different colors, and and I have like a red head and a white one and a blue one and a yellow one, and a purple one, and a pink one. I just bought a Fawn 78 head, which is like a tan, um, just a couple days ago. So I love all the different colors. It just looks ridiculous. And when we play the festivals, everybody always likes to come up and look at it and stuff it's you know it's pretty cool i have this pedal this guitar i use and it's um it's this gold john five model fender telecaster and i play it all the time i mean it's just i play it so much i would use that guitar oh they made a squire version of that guitar and it's just sells really well um that guitar and like you know any marshall anything any Marshall, you know, and uh, probably like a Super Overdrive, and that's probably all I would need. I could, I could probably, if someone said that's all you're gonna play forever, I'd be fine with it, and you know, I'd have no problem. Awesome. Oh, I'd need a cable. I'd need a cord, and a pick. There you go. Eddie Monster picker.
creature from the Black Lagoon pick or something. Well, it a lot has changed, you know, a lot has changed. So much has changed. I would say get yourself out there as much as possible. I would say do something every day to like push yourself forward in the, you know, where you want to be. Even if it's making a phone call or if it's having band rehearsal or you know, just make yourself, you know, push yourself a little bit every day and pretty soon by a certain amount of time you're going to be you know this much further along because if you don't do it somebody else is going to do it and I always say that even setting up your phone you can do it with your phone nowadays and play something you can be on YouTube you could be a sensation you know and practice what you love play what you love play what you love and I think that's what's most important because I had a really smart guitar teacher growing up you know, I wanted to learn, I don't know, whatever it was, you know, a Jimi Hendrix song, but he would teach me a little bit of it, and I was so happy and so excited that I could play a little bit of this that I wouldn't put the guitar down. But if they taught me, like, you know, um, Happy Birthday, I wouldn't be so inspired to never put that guitar down. Mm -hmm.